Peter is, uh, was found by Jesus when he was throwing out the net. And you always see Peter taking the lead, stepping out, the first one to stand up on Pentecost, the first one to ask the difficult question, the first one to go to Gentiles, the first one to go through the door. He's always initiating, always casting out the net, always getting started. And now you know we need Peter's more now than ever, right? And then the next in line is, you think John, but it's not, it's Paul. Because if you look at the book of Acts, it's Peter and then Paul. Peter and then Paul, okay? Paul comes next, and what Paul was was a tent maker. And what is the church but the tabernacle of God? It's the tent of God. And who teaches us the doctrine of the body of Christ? How you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. The meaning of the church. The beautiful mystery of the church. Who does more of that than the Apostle Paul himself? Peter starts... Paul builds up, but at the end comes John, and John uh, was a fisherman too, but he wasn't casting out his net when Peter met him. He was mending the nets. Why? Because at the end, and if you think about it, John is the end. It's the last gospel. It's the la among the last epistles. It's the last revelation from God, and John comes at the end, and he doesn't come to initiate, he doesn't come to bring anything new. If you think about um, his letter, he says, I write no new thing to you, but the thing which you heard from the beginning. This is the message we heard from the start. He's always taking us back. He's always mending the nets. Why? Because of Gnostics, false teachers, false prophets, heresies, errors, and the just blatant uh, defection from God by many cr Christians and church leaders and whole churches. The net gets frayed, it's, snar it's tangled, it's, sn it, it, it's snarled, it's ripped, it's torn. The effectiveness goes away. I remember coming out of the faith message, and I had to learn everything all over again. I didn't even know what prayer was. What's prayer? Oh, it's blasting a hole through the heavenlies and taking authority over the spirits and naming the strong man. No, it's just supplicating to God. The net gets torn. What's faith? What's righteousness? What's salvation? Really? Yeah, you got to go back to the beginning. You got to go back to what you think you already knew. And we got to be renewed. We don't need new rocket science. We need to really get light from God on what He gave us in the first place. Because back in John's day, the knowledge of God is being redefined and the confusion is profound and there's two problems that this creates number one very confused believers who can no longer abide in Christ and number two churches are being filled up with false converts that aren't even saved and don't know it I want to take a look at a very very important chapter of the Bible in my view if you don't understand this you don't understand anything you don't get this you, and on the other hand, you get this, and it deepens your apprehension of everything. It's Genesis 3. Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. By the way, let me just read the whole chapter and then go back and comment on it. Sometimes you've got to get the whole chunk and just let it wash over you, right? Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open, and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. 
And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you've done this, you're cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. On thy belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all of the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Unto the woman, he said, I'll greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shall you bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of my, thy wife, and have eaten of the tree, which I commanded thee, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed in the east of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. It's amazing, isn't it? Just to hear the whole chapter, just to listen, just to let it work on your soul. This is the word of God. Genesis is the Word of God. One of the things I've been uh, telling people lately is that um, everything in Genesis, the Genesis is the foundational book. That means everything that God has to say to humanity, the foundation of it is in Genesis. Everything in Genesis, and by the way, if you're going to give an account of the beginning, there's a lot of things you could put in there. And there's a lot of things you would put in there, a lot of things you wouldn't think you'd put in there. But the Creator took everything that He thought was significant to our foundations and handpicked everything that he put in there. For example, it doesn't say Cain and Abel were their only children or anything. There's a lot of other details, but he chose these details for this reason. He wanted to know, uh, he wanted you to know his account of the creation, which I, I won't get into. He wanted you to know his, what, what happened, the fall. What, how did we fall? He wanted us to know uh, in the story of Cain and Abel, the two ways that humanity would go, the way of Cain, the will worshiper, the first murderer, uh, the way of, of Abel and Seth, you know, the substitute. He wanted us to understand the conditions that led to the flood. This is the foundation. You know, there's a scripture in Psalm 11. If the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Satan has been attacking Genesis. There's a lot of, I just saw a book Oh, God, it broke my heart. Evangelical pastors did a, a group book. I used to le believe in creation. Now we've come along to believe in evolution. I don't remember the name of the book, but they were so happy to shed the reproach of Christ and not look unsophisticated anymore and to be accepted by the academy, right? But uh, I'm not ashamed of my belief in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. I believe every bit of it. God wanted us to know what happened with the flood. God wanted us to know, he gave us the gift of uh, Genesis 10, uh, unique in all of, uh, all of human uh, records, this beautiful family tree of the human race. I mean, Genesis 10 is so relevant right now. God wanted us to understand what happened with the Tower of Babel because that's happening again. 
everything happens again, you know. One thing about Genesis is that um, as it was at the beginning, so shall it be at the end, okay. It all happens. Uh, Genesis and Revelation are so tied together. And, and, and I'll show you this by the end of this message. Genesis and Revelation, all the Bible is one. All the Bible is absolutely one. That's the difference between inspired uh, Word of God and other books. The Bible is absolutely one. There's a unity of it, but some books of the Bible have a strong resonance with others. In Genesis, Gospel of John, and Revelation, so seamless. Every single problem raised in the book of Genesis is addressed in the Gospel of God in John and in the book of Revelation. Even the tree of life comes back. We're barred from it at the end of this chapter. But in the, in the book of Revelation, I saw the tree of life it was right there. <laughs> Praise God. We win. Amen. Now, um, so, and Genesis 3, uh, th this, is a, this is an observation I, I made recently, too, that there's a vision in Revelation of a woman clothed with a son. You know what I'm talking about? Revelation 12. And she's pregnant. And there's a serpent there just getting ready to devour the child. It's just a horrifying vision. And think about it. Genesis 3 is a woman with a serpent. But by Revelation 12, it's a woman with a dragon. She's pregnant. The dragon's ferocious. And there's the seed of the woman in Genesis 3, the seed of the woman in Revelation 12. Just, it just, it's everything's coming to a head. That's why I think everything in Genesis that speaks of the beginnings, especially these early chapters, is also eschatological. It speaks to the end. Now let's start in, oh, there's one other thing I want to say about Genesis. In Genesis 1, the first account of the creation, it's uh, fantastic, of course, but the, the name for God is, is Elohim which is a reference to his majesty, his power, and his might. But in Genesis 2, it's the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. That's more personal, okay? There's not two authors, by the way. It's just, it's a telescoping. Genesis 1 and then Genesis 2 takes a closer look. Genesis 1 says, and God made man in his image. That didn't he? He said, God made man in his image. Male and female created them. In the image of God created them. But Genesis 2 just telescopes. Now I'm going to share you something that I think is beautiful. I'm just going to share it because I think it's beautiful. It has nothing to do with Genesis 3, but I'm going to share this because I think it's beautiful. Everything that God made up until a certain point, he spoke it into being, didn't he? Let there be light. Let the waters divide. Let the seas teem with life. Let there be cattle on the fields. Let there be birds in the sky. He speaks it all. But in Genesis 2, it telescopes. It says, but when he made man, when he made man, he didn't speak man into existence, did he? That's right. He got down on his knees, formed the dust of the earth with his hands. You could say he got his hands dirty. It's close. And the man lays there lifeless, and then he does something like mouth to mouth. He breathes into his nostrils. Let me ask you a personal question. Who would you ever let breathe into your nostrils? Who are you close enough to do that? You know what he's saying there? I just like to say this, especially in this humanistic, atheistic age, that they think they're exalting man, but they really devalue him. Man's special. Man's not animal. There's a kid that broke free of his parents snuck into a cage with a silverback ape and they had to save the kids so they shot the ape and you could not believe the hate that they got for shooting this silverback ape the people are so confused now even about such basic things as the value of a person I would shoot all the silverback apes in the world to save a little baby or a little boy but they're confused you got to be confused. If you get rid of Genesis, then you're confused about what man is. This is how we have our modern atrocities. 
The USA just passed a 54 million abortion. My knees knock. I tremble. There is a holy God. How did we get so perverted? Well, we threw out the one account that actually gives man real lasting significance. The most high God bent down on the ground with his hands formed the man, got his hands dirty, and then breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man's special. Now there's another thing too. Once again, I haven't even got to my text yet. I tell you what, I'm giving you this for free. You know why? Because I think it's beautiful and I think it's relevant. I just do things just because I think they're beautiful from Scripture. God's beautiful. I just told you how man was made. But then he goes on and says, now here's how woman was made. What? Yes, God went through creation before the fall, and everything he saw, he said, now that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good, that's good. But even before the fall, there was one not good. It's not good for man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. So how do you turn a not good into a good? I'll wait till the shade comes. How do you turn a not good into a good? It looks an awful lot like death and resurrection. He puts the man into some kind of a deep sleep and performs the first surgery. The first shedding of blood happens before the fall. It doesn't literally say he took a rib out of his side. It says he took his side out of his side. Now this is different than taking dirt. This is refined dirt. Man, you are refined dirt, but woman, you are refined, refined dirt. Now, I'm going to tell you this, and I'm not trying to be funny or cheeky. Man, you're special. But woman, it's unbelievable. The care he took. The way he did it. This is a real scene at the beginning of the Bible. The first wedding. Ever think about that? There's a wedding at the beginning of the Bible and a wedding at the end of the Bible. It is so beautiful and surreal. He brings him out of his deep sleep. The man has a scar in his side. He presents to him his counterpart. The first man prophesies. His eyes aren't dimmed by sin yet. So he sees way down through time. And he sees that something bigger than he and the woman is being played out. He actually prophesied, he said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. Well, really, Adam, what is a father and mother? Oh, I don't know. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Well, his eye was so undimmed by sin that I believe Paul shows us that he not only saw him and the first bride, but he saw way down through time Another man with a hole in his side being presented with another bride purchased by blood presented him at the end of time. For Paul told us that every wedding that occurs is bigger than the bride and groom. We are now bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh. But he says, I speak not of men only, but of Christ and the church. It's just beautiful, isn't it? You would think we understand in this evil generation what we lost when we threw that out the window? You know how many people just dismiss with marriage out of hand? No concept whatsoever? This is an evil generation. But it's also a heartbreaking one. Because everything precious and elevating to humanity has been dis it's just it's discarded. And people have been cheapened and coarsened and debased. The frightening thing is, is, especially the younger generation, the culture is so toxic, it wants them. 
Now we come to Genesis 3, though. Now, look, here's the thing. Genesis 2 is more personal than Genesis 1. Genesis 1 says, Elohim said this, and Elohim spoke that into existence. Genesis 2, it's Yahweh Elohim, a personal name, the, the God of covenant, the, the personal God, the infinite personal God of the Bible did this and that and the other. In Genesis 3, we go back, and it opens with the serpent, and the serpent is subtle, it says. But really, an animal could be subtle? Doesn't subtlety imply intelligence, calculation, wisdom, insight? The serpent's subtle? Well, the Bible itself is being subtle. Because you have to realize, he's not talking about a reptile here. He's talking about an intelligent being behind the reptile, speaking through the reptile, not to the man. This is the first part of the subtlety but addressing the woman. Now, how is it that that is subtle? Well, in God's creation, there is an order. And God did give the commission to the man and gave a charge to the man and ordained that the woman help the man through life. If you think about the joys that were set before them, you go have a life. You have kids. You love each other. You be married. You got this garden. You got good, meaningful work. You go and be fruitful and multiply. Wow! That's beautiful. But sin destroys everything, right? Here's one thing I'm hoping people uh, get these days. I'm not giving rocket science anymore. I'm going simple. Sin is hate. Painful, destructive. If only people could really relate their personal pain and grief from this thing or that thing or the other to their sins or to sin, it might be helpful. The serpent subtle, there's someone speaking through the serpent that's subtle. An intelligent being with an agenda, a calculation. Now let's, we're let in on this first conversation. Uh, the serpent is subtle, and he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said. Now this is subtlety. Let me point out the subtlety, because I think we're living that subtlety. The serpent is not saying anything for sure. He's not saying that he knows what God said, and he's not saying he doesn't know what God's saying. He's not asserting anything at this point. It's all ambiguous. Did he say, are, did he say that you can't eat of all the trees of the garden? Well, there's subtlety there, and I think I should point it out because we're living this subtlety right now. The serpent is speaking to this generation, and believe me when I tell you he's got an agenda. Many, many people will go to hell because they don't even know they're listening to the serpent. Did God, did God really say that you can't eat of all the trees of the garden? Well, that's uh, an exaggeration, isn't it? God never said anything of the sort. And that is a, a, a question that's loaded, that's implied to uh, suggest the idea that God is much stricter than he really is. And the serpent is looking for something. What is he looking for by these questions? Well, he's looking for an opening. Well, what would an opening be? An opening would be any level in their hearts of alienation and disaffection from God. That's what he's looking for. Now Eve does right at first when she talks to the woman, although she really should have said to her husband, hey, this phone call is for you, okay? <laughs> By the way, he was there. Let that soak in. He was standing right there. She said, God didn't say that. Let me correct the record. God's not that strict. God only said that we can't eat of this tree, nor can we touch it, lest we die. Right there, the serpent's antennas went up. He, I see it, the opening. Really? Well, it's not as big an opening as he suggested. I mean, she doesn't think God's that cruel. But she did maximize ever so slightly the prohibition of God. He never said you can't touch it. They were commanded to dress the garden. 
He only said you can't eat of it. Ever slightly. A little stricter. And the second one gave the serpent more hope. I see an opening. Why? Lest you die. You ever think about that? She minimized the sanction. If you read Genesis 2, it's very clear. The day you eat of that tree, in dying, you will surely die. But the woman said, oh, we can't even touch that tree. And we might die. So, how are we living that today? Well, the, the number one teacher on the politically incorrect subject of hellfire and damnation is Jesus Christ himself. He's the one where you get these expressions like weeping and gnashing of teeth, out into outer darkness, depart from me, the work of the good. Jesus, it's, all, it's almost so, so horrible that God committed it to Jesus himself. So no one can say, oh, Paul, boy, he was hung up. Or old James, wow, what a, what a twisted mind. No, Jesus is the one that assures us that there's a hell to, to shun. To flee from the wrath to come. That's Jesus. I know of a preacher in America who started off so fundamentalist, so evangelical. You know how evangelical he started off? Someone says, how? Okay, I'll tell you how. <laughs> he started a church. And his first teaching series was verse by verse through the book of Leviticus. <laughs> You've got to have confidence in the Word of God to think that that's how you're going to build the church. But he must have got discouraged at some point. Or he defected. And he worked on trying to make the church more relevant. Where did this take him? Well, by now he's written a book called Love Wins that denies the reality of hell. See? You shall surely die. Well, maybe you won't. This is not just a lie, but all those who accept this, this is an opening. This is an alienation from God, a rejection of God's revealed truth. Lest you die, one out of seven people in the world are Hindus, but it's the main teaching of Hindus, a reincarnation. You will not surely die. You don't surely die. America's embracing Hinduism. Oh, well, probably a lot of people here too. Churches have uh, yoga. And they, we, we even use words like karma, and it just, it's just it's saturating our life. This is a false religion, a demonic religion, and you, you're not supposed to have anything to do with it. But Christians are compromising with it. The serpent is speaking, and the serpent is undermining, and there are a lot of people who no longer believe in a final judgment, a hell to, sh to, to run from, okay? Look, uh, uh, one of the things, and I'm going to give an aside here again, why can't this generation believe in hell? I've done a lot of praying about that and thinking and seeking God. And I think that i got a couple of answers. Why can't this generation believe that there's a lake of fire? I know I believed it. When I came to Christ, there was a major motivation, okay? I knew that there was a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And I knew by the time Jesus was through with me in the Sermon on the Mount that I was on my way to hell and I deserved it. But well, why can't this generation believe that there's a hell? Well, here's why. It has to do with, more with the way people see God than anything. Let me explain what I mean. Okay. Isaiah believed in God all his life. But one day he went to the temple and he saw God. And as soon as he saw God, he pronounced judgment on himself. Woe is me. It's not just woe is me. That means I'm damned. I'm on my way to hell. I'm a sinner. What happened? Okay. Look, people can't believe that there's anybody in the universe so august, so holy, so high, so lifted up, so good, that to cross him in any way is to forfeit everything that makes your life worthwhile. They just don't believe anybody's that important. Couldn't be, okay? It 
just couldn't be. See what I'm saying? And why not? Well, preachers quit preaching God. They don't preach the attributes of God. They don't lift God up. The churches are man-centered. They're humanistic. What I'm saying is, once you see God, you believe in hell immediately. Isaiah did. What was me? I'm undone. I saw the Lord. High and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And the angels cried to each other, holy, holy, holy. And I said, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. He saw God. He saw himself. And he knew he believed in judgment. They don't see God. God to them is a pal, a friend, a funny guy. This, you know, nightclub churches, feel-good religion, has actually reduced the vision of God. That's why they can't believe in hell. That's why a lot of them are having a hard time believing uh, the, the crucifixion of Christ. Let me elaborate on this. To believe in the crucifixion of Christ presupposes you believe in the wrath of God. You can't believe in the crucifixion of Christ without believing in the wrath of God. You believe that we're so sinful, so evil, and, and, and that our sins are such an affront to a holy God that the only way that you could even be, think about being redeemed is for the best person in the universe to come down from heaven and to present himself as a substitute for the sinners. And to die in our place as our sin. He made him who knew no sin to be sin. People don't believe they're that bad. They just can't believe they're that bad. I mean, you look at the Bible. What really happened? In the what did they do? What did Adam and Eve do that brought every tear, every sorrow, every broken home, all broken health, all the wars, all the pain? What did they do that brought that on us? Well, let's look at Genesis 3. They didn't commit genocide. They didn't rape each other. Then what did they actually do? Well, let's go to Genesis 3 and look at this. The serpent said to the woman, verse 4, you will not surely die. Well, by, she could tell by Eve's response and by Adam's non-response that now the couple was ready to hear the word of God openly denied. Okay. So he just come right out and said, you will not surely die. And it says in verse 5, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, then your eyes will be opened and you will be as gods, knowing good and evil. I want to stop and say this. There's a lot of lies in this world. And the Christian church should be at war against lies. We're witnesses to the truth, among other things, right? We're called to witness to the truth. What truth? Whatever truth the spirit of Antichrist is contesting right now. We're the ones that call the witness to the truth. But underneath every lie is something called the lie. In 2 Thessalonians it says, For this cause God will solve them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie and be damned. What's the lie? Oh, it's the lie of the serpent in the garden. What is it? I went to a Word Faith Pastors Conference when I was in error. And I didn't know better. My wife went with me. We were excited. We've been Christians about five years. We've been pastors for about two years. A car pulls in with a vanity license plate. That means in the U.S. you can buy your message on your license. It said, I am a God. And people go, whoa, what a bold witness. And I looked at my wife and she looked at me and we said, what have we got ourselves in? that wasn't right and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said all he's doing is taking your teachers to their logical conclusion and I had to admit that was right Copeland and Hagen teach that we're little gods so do all the other false teachers Bill Johnson the whole bit all based on the premise of the serpent's lie you shall be as gods knowing good and evil well what does it mean to be as gods knowing good and evil well, that's a mystery. It's called the mystery of iniquity. But I will explain one part of it this morning, or this afternoon. It might be morning by the time I'm done, right? <laughs> what does it mean to be as gods and knowing good and evil? 
I don't think it means that right away you know everything. I think it has more to do with you decide for yourself what good and evil is. That's what it means to be as a God. You decide for yourself what good and evil is. Because I think hell is evil. I wouldn't worship a God that would have a hell. There you go. You're deciding for yourself what good and evil is. you got to accept Jesus. you got to accept the word of God. But look at the next verse. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. This is not telling you truth here in verse 6. Let me explain. This is true, but it's not truth. What verse 6 is, is the psychology of the woman. God is telling you what she's thinking, okay? Because obviously the tree is not good for fruit. If you eat it, you'll die. So that's not good, okay? God's telling you that what the woman thought in her mind, she said, I see that fruit. It looks good to me. And then she said, this looks delicious, come to think of it. And then she said, and I actually believe that preacher, that skinny preacher hanging on a tree branch, that told me how liberating it would be to just take that. So she plucked the fruit, didn't she? And in the process, wiped her feet on love for God, true faith, which is loyalty to God as well as belief in God, commitment, love for anybody else. She's doing this for her. She eats the fruit and gives to her husband, and he eats the fruit. That's when we fell. It says in verse 7, And the eyes of them both were open. Well, you know, this is interesting. It's about knowledge, isn't it? You could know some things two ways. One way you can know something is just to take God's word at it. Right? The other way, if you insist, is you can experience it. See that tree out of the deep? That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Take my word for it. You eat it, you'll die. Well, they look at it. Okay, I don't know what death is. I don't know what evil is. But all I really know is good. Everything's been good. I've got everything I need from God. No. Now they'll know evil by experience. Now they know evil in a different way. Has anybody here ever come to know something that you wish to God you didn't know? What's evil by experience? Alienation, blame, next thing they're hiding. They never hid in their life. There was nothing to hide from. They lived in the light. They're free. It's a lot less complicated when you're sincere, right? If you're a hypocrite, life is complicated. You always got to cover. But when you're free, you're free. Amen? But now they're not free. Now they're hiding. They still bear the image of God. So they fashion for themselves. These ingenious clothes out of fig trees or fig leaves. And they put them on themselves to cover up the shame, especially of their sexuality. Why? Because somehow or other, part of what evil is, is original sin. Everything to do with birth, which birth is a blessing. Remember, be fruitful and multiply. But sin causes a, a sorrow. That's why even the law of Moses, the menstruation law, circumcision, everything to do with human sexuality presupposes guilt, pain, sorrow. Why? Because we pass on our sin nature to our children. The most painful thing I've ever seen in my life is when I see my worst of my kids, my iniquities. I hate them. I don't want to pass them on. I pray to God. Now, um, 
So anyway, I'm going to move along because I took more blood uh, time than I thought. But it says there that uh, the Lord came. In Genesis 3, you see the coming of the Lord. They're hiding in the garden. The Lord says, Adam, where are you? Now, God doesn't ask questions for information because he knows everything. So why does he ask questions? He wants to elicit a humble confession of sin. Here's another one that's not rocket science, but I feel led to share it. Whoever confesses and forsakes his sin will have mercy, but whoever covers his sin will not prosper. I'm telling people everywhere I go, keep short accounts with God. Jesus is coming. And especially beware of secret sins. They're the most dangerous. The best possible thing to do is confess your sin. Look, if I'm saying this for one person, okay, and besides that, hypocrisy is tiresome. It's hard to play act all the time, to pretend to be something you are when you're not, or pretend not to be something you are when you are, and then, uh, you know, to try to keep it all straight. Hypocrisy is short-sighted because there's nothing hidden that won't be revealed and nothing secret that won't be shouted from the housetops. you believe that? You know what the big sign of that is? I believe God's speaking to the whole world right now. WikiLeaks. The kings of the earth and their rulers in their secret council are literally being exposed by WikiLeaks, by Anonymous, by some of these video journalists that we have in America. They just sneak in and they just take their, their, their secret councils and just shout them from the rooftops. Look, that's a sign to the world. It's not just those bad guys. Everything is going to be revealed. Amen? So the best possible policy is just to make your mind up. You're going to be real. You're going to be sincere. Well, <clears throat> so where are you? Who told you you were naked? It's an inquest. It's a judgment. The coming of the Lord is a trial, a judgment. And the judge comes. And this is a foretaste of it. So no matter how ready or not, when the Lord comes, everyone gets pulled out of their hiding and Adam refuses accountability. You know how I know that? Because he blamed God and he blamed his wife. The woman you gave me. God doesn't even ask him another thing. He just moves on to Eve. Why did God ask him? He wanted to get his confession. Eve, the serpent made me do it. She refuses accountability too. And he just moves on. The three perps are there, Adam and Eve and the serpent. But he asks Adam and he asks Eve a question because he wants to elicit a humble confession. But he has, why? Because he has an intention to save them. But he has no intention to save the serpent. So he doesn't ask him anything. Instead, Adam and Eve, in the gloom of this trial, get to overhear the gospel, the first gospel. He says to the serpent in verse 15, excuse me, <clears throat> verse 14, the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, you're cursed above all cattle and above every feast of the field. Upon thy belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Whoa. Her seed? A woman has a seed? Adam knew so much more than we did. His mind was not tainted by sin. He's brilliant, right? Women don't have a seed. We have the seed. What are you telling us, God? I'm telling you, someone's going to come through the woman, virgin born. He will undo the he will crush the serpent's head and remove the primal curse. He will set you free, set everything right again, but not without pain. The serpent will bruise his heel. And I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. The woman has a seed. The seed of the woman is the virgin-born Messiah, the Savior. The seed of the serpent has yet to come. It's the son of perdition. The man soon to arrive, the embodiment.
embodiment of this age and his lawlessness, the man of lawlessness. He'll be revealed, but the Lord will destroy him with the breath of his mouth and the brightness of his coming. Amen? Amen. It's going to get dark, but then glory and light will shine like we've anticipated, like you can't believe. The sufferings of this present time aren't even be worthy to be compared with his glory. Amen? But there's another sense, and this is where I'll close, I promise. Man, you could go on on with this chapter. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent are not only individuals. They are corporate entities. The seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent are groups of people. It's not a physical seed of the woman in this sense, but a spiritual and moral affinity. This is the way the human race will go, divided into two, the seed of the woman, the seed of the serpent, as corporate people. And the serpent can't have physical children. Satan has no physical children. There are not this third in the race of people, the seed of the serpent. That's the stupidest thing. But it's a very common doctrine in some places. Certain, Satan doesn't have physical children. But there is a spiritual and moral affinity uh, with Satan. A lot of good share that human race shares. Uh, Jesus wasn't just insulting people, nor was John the Baptist when he said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He's referring to Genesis 3, the God defying the seed of the serpent, the ones with the inward affinity with the devil, the ones who manifest that same spirit of independent pride by which their father, the devil, fell, and who won't acknowledge their sin and their hopeless condition. They won't submit to be saved by the merits of someone else. These are the ones who either try to do what they need to do themselves to save themselves by works or will worship, or just deny the need altogether. And if they do believe in God, they clamor and murmur and complain at for not revolving around them. In many cases, they really do believe the lie, and they don't hesitate to violate God's will on any level. God's will doesn't even come into account. You want to live with a girl outside of marriage? Do it. You want to be a homosexual? Do it. You want to corrupt someone? Do it. This is the seed of the serpent. And such are the serpent's seed, distinguished by the spirit, that animates their father, the devil, and they're doomed at last to take their part in the lake of fire. Now who are the seed of the woman? Well, in order to explain that, I have to just bring up one more detail from this chapter before I let you go. After he pronounces the judgment and the curse, he brings the man and the woman before him. And this has uh, got to be the case. He stripped them of their fig leaves. He, he, he took them off because the fig leaves are in the front. And then to their horror, they saw the first physical death because he killed a beast and made clothes out of the fleece and made them put on the clothes. What? Bloody garments. Gross negative, gooey, death. You want us to put them on? Oh yeah, that's the only way to cover your shame. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So the woman and the man humbly submitted to the, 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 the instruction of the holy God and allowed themselves to be clothed with these skins. And they, uh, they humbled themselves and waited for the triumph of the seed of, of the woman. They submitted themselves to the, to the gospel, to the word. This is the true seed of the woman. Now you see this expression again in Genesis 12. The serpent becomes a dragon. 
how does a serpent become a dragon? Oh, in the garden, when he's on the outside, he's got to be subtle. But once he gets in, once he's accepted and followed, now this is my closing, we're seeing the serpent transport himself into a dragon. He's had to be the serpent in the West because there was still a lot of Christianity. But he's turning into a dragon. I'm telling you, and I'm not trying to be dramatic, persecution is coming in the church in America. Our politicians are openly hostile, and they're not even subtle about it. There's a new wind blowing. The serpent's becoming a dragon. But you know what? We believe that Jesus is coming. We humbly wait for the fullness of our salvation, the final triumph of the seed of the woman. We put our faith in God, and we call upon the name of the Lord. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, everyone.